So uh, yesterday um, we uh, we looked at doing a linear regression, um, and uh, we sort of got this result after many iterations. Now, I think it's safe to say that there's a problem with this linear regression uh, in terms of predicting um, future. Uh, marathon times, if we extrapolate uh, what this regression is saying, it'll say that um, we're going by, I don't know, 2040, people will be going negative marathon times. Now, I think that's unlikely to happen. Uh, I also think it's unlikely that even if we look at our prediction for 2016, uh, that people will go as fast as it's saying. I mean, we're getting down to that's like a four minute mile uh, down here. So I don't think anyone's going to be doing that. So, so what's really wrong here? Well, this rate of improvement isn't constant. Um, I think it's very arguable that with data like this, that what one should really be looking at is um, perhaps taking the logarithm. So, uh, I mean, we're not going to do this, but I think just thinking about real data, because these times are positive constrained, and what you might be getting is a percentage improvement in each year. So each year, you're perhaps expecting uh, the next year's pace to be 99% of the previous year's pace. Perhaps what you're really seeing here is something that would be log linear. Um, but then perhaps also it's reaching some sort of limit of human performance. Now, that's the way you should look at real data, but we're just looking at general uh, data processing methods um, and so ignoring what we know about this type of time series what we just want is we want some way of modeling this data in a non-linear manner so we don't want to just be extrapolating forward we want to take account of this sort of curved shape that probably comes about through uh, a small percentage improvement each year so what we're going to do for that is look at uh, something called a uh, basis function models. So, basis functions. So, the problem with linear regression is very often x is not linearly related to y and you get these particularly, what I really don't like is these extrapolations. Even if something's linear in the regime you're looking at it, it, it may well be that as you move out of that regime, it, you can't extrapolate in that way. So um, that might not be a problem for a statistical analysis that's being performed by a human, and the human is aware of the region in which the model is valid. But in machine learning, we're very often interested in putting a model into a computer and forgetting about it. Um, and the computer isn't conscious of the fact that the model is valid in only a certain regime. So we want actually the model to reflect um, the fact that uh, it's not valid outside that regime and not make these confident extrapolative predictions. So we're going to see if we can go some way towards fixing that up today. So a solution to making things non-linear is to actually call, create what we call a feature space. So we define um, phi of x where phi is a non-linear function of x. And what we do is, instead of saying, so in our previous model, we actually had a phi of x where you had um, uh, two components. So this is the new way of writing the model. f of x is equal to the sum over some weights, w, times these basis functions, phi j. Now, in the previous model, you could have thought that what phi of x were, the, so there's there were two basis functions in the previous model and they were phi of x oh, pen doesn't work phi of x 1 uh, phi 1 of x, sorry, is equal to x and phi 2 of x is equal to 1 so it's a constant function in x so that means if you took look at the sum of this, you were saying f of x was equal to phi 1 of x, which was equal to x, and w1 was m, and phi 2 of x was equal to 1, and w2 of x was equal to c. So it was a particular, the old model, the linear model, is this particular special case of this more general model with particular definitions for these basis functions phi of x, right? So they were very uninteresting basis functions. They had um, 
Will these work better if they're... S no, they won't work better if they're wet, will they? No, because it's Difficult not... To rise on. Yeah, no, it's not... Um, like that's a white uh, blackboard, isn't it? Um, so, if we were to draw these basis functions as a function of x, they would look like that, so this is phi 1 of x, and they would look like that. Now, actually, I'm going to refer to that as phi 0 of x, because one way of looking at these things is as if they're polynomials in x. So this is a first order polynomial in x, and this is a zeroth order polynomial in x. Yeah? So we're always building. What we were doing was adding these two functions together to get our result. So scaling and adding. So scaling this function allows it to sort of twist, and scaling this function moves it up and down. So the phi zero function moves our regression up and down, and the phi one function twists our regression left and right. So that's the setup we had, yeah? So we had these two bases. If we scaled this one, we scaled it by m. And if we scaled this one, we scaled it by c. And we sum the two together and we get a linear regression. So polynomial world, the obvious thing to do is perhaps to adapt that to be a quadratic basis. So this is what we'd call a global basis function because it's something that is effect across the entire input region for x. We're going to look also at local basis functions, which I think are much more appropriate generally. But this extends nicely out of our previous model because we're just taking this, so we're saying y equals mx plus c plus dx squared or something like that. But in order to generalize this, what we're going to say is y is equal to w0 times 1 plus w1 times x plus w2 times x squared. Um, and this is our basis. So we've just drawn our basis. So any questions at that point? Yeah? So we've sort of expanded our, our input to be three-dimensional. Yeah? So instead of a one-dimensional, we're now working in this three-dimensional space, which is a non-linear mapping for our original inputs. And that's a sort of a very common theme. So what I can do is I can show you what functions might look like from this by just here I've just sampled w from a Gaussian distribution. So I'm just saying give me some random w's and weight these basis functions. So obviously this one's using a negative weight on the quadratic term. Um, this one here is also using a negative weight on the quadratic term but it's dominated by the linear term where the weight is positive and 1.2. Um, the bias term here is minus 1.35, so it's slightly biased down. Um, here's one with a positive quadratic term that's dominating, uh, and a bias term, so the zero point at zero is around minus 1.5. Okay, so that's the sort of a quadratic basis. But like I said, I actually quite like uh, something a bit more local, so... Good question. Yeah, could you just provide us what the basis is? In which sense? Definition-wise? Definition. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it means... I'm not too keen to give a mathematical definition because I think there's a very strict one and I probably would give it wrong. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, right, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> basis. Uh, oh, I don't have internet, so I can't cheat. So, what do I, so a basis? Um, I, from the perspective of mathematics, um, I see it as just mapping. Um, the way we're using basis functions here is just a way of mapping to a non-linear space. A basis in mathematics uh, means something more specific that I don't want to go into the details of. Um, but the way we use basis functions in machine learning, or a basis, is just uh, a transformation of our input space. It's normally non-linear. It could be, I mean, you can have a linear basis which projects you down. Um, but normally non-linear and maps it into a higher dimensional space. I don't know, John, you have a better definition than that. Well, could we think of it as like the signal is decomposed into, into sort of, like, like the bases would be yeah. the, the sort of things of which a signal is composed? Yes. 
the sum function of this made up by adding together these sort of Yeah, I think that's true. So uh, John's answer that it's it's the way that the signal is decomposed um, into different parts. I think that comes through certainly in wavelets as well, a wavelet basis where you actually look for orthogonality. So I think that's why I don't know whether the strict mathematic mathematically you don't need it to be orthogonal, do you? You can just have an orthogonal basis. Um, so. Yeah, as John's saying, it's a decomposition of the signal. So in, in wavelet analysis, they often look for orthogonal bases, uh, which means that in this high dimensional space, each of these directions is actually orthogonal to each other. But here, this basis isn't orthogonal. So um, yeah, it's just a decomposition of the signal. Um, so the input, if your input, how is your basis responding? So, well, let's, let's talk about this and then it's perhaps, I think, nicer to think about in terms of these radial basis functions because they're local. So we'll just bring them up. Uh, so here, phi 1 is, this is a sort of Gaussian quadratic form. So it's e to the minus, um, well, I put x plus 1 squared, but it's just uh, e to the minus x squared loca uh, located on minus 1. Yeah, so it's centered on minus one. It's one at um, uh, minus one, and then it drops away. So it like, looks like a Gaussian, which is not normalized and has variance one. Probably shouldn't call it a Gaussian. People don't like it when you call these things Gaussian because they're not probability distributions, but they look like a Gaussian probability distribution. So we could have that one there, and uh, I've lost the uh, focus on the window. Uh, then we could have a second one located at zero. And then we could have a third one located at 1. And so back to the question, the basis here is saying, well, look, if you have an input on, that's in this region here, in the high dimensional space, it scores highly on this basis function, and it scores low on these two basis functions. So um, this is a three dimensional basis. So you can think of, they're not sort of fully orthogonal. But you can think of, um, in this three-dimensional space, the input that's coming in here is scoring highly in one direction, and it's close to zero in the other two. But if you move, as you move here, what happens is you drop down that direction, and you start reappearing in this next direction. So you actually end up following through this basis in this sort of way. So as, as your input moves along here, the high-dimensional basis you're mapping into starts here, and then drops down and then comes up in the middle and then down again and out. So here I'm sort of plotting the values of these functions in three dimensions because we've got these three dimensional inputs now. Yeah? And what you get the ability to do in the basis function is in effect build a linear regression in that space, in that nonlinear space. Yeah? Question? Um, the, the five observations, are they observable, especially in the data, are they hidden? You mean the phi observations, they, you would always be able to observe them for a given data point. You can compute what the basis is. For each variable? For every data point. So um, if we, for example, if the input is uh, here, let's say that's 1980, and 1980 has one basis function, you can compute the value of that basis function there is 1, and the value of these two basis functions is something small, perhaps 0.05. So you, instead of having a single input, which is 1980, you map to a space where your new input is 0 0.051, 0 0.05. And then in order to get your prediction, you add those things up. So we're look at, looking again at a regression function here. What we're doing is we're saying we've got W1 is minus 0.47. So you can see the effect of that minus 0.47 in this basis function appearing here. W2 is minus 0.18. So it's also low, but we don't quite see the bump because it's overwhelmed by this bump here. And then W3 is minus 1.81. So for any new input, we can ask the question, first of all, we can ask the question, uh, what are the values of each individual basis function? And in fact, we need to do that in order to compute what the value of the function is. So we can say, if we're here, the value of each individual basis function is like 0.9, 0.1 and close to zero. That's our sort of new vector of inputs, and we call that vector sometimes phi. 
the vector phi, the computation of the three basis functions is three dimensional. And then to get our function itself, we then multiply those bases by these weights, giving us a point on this curve. Yeah? Does that make sense? So you can see we've got a nonlinear curve now. So it can move up and down. It's constrained by these bases, but we're going to deal with that later as we get to Gaussian processes. Um, just for a question. The, how do we arrive at the values of W? How do I R? Ah. Yeah, the W values. How do you know what they should be? Yes. That's what we're going to do next. So here, the question was, uh, how do I know the values of W? So here all I'm doing is I'm sampling, I'm generating them randomly. Just to show examples of random functions. That's a concept I like and a concept we'll increasingly use. Just to give you an idea of what these functions can look like if you build this basis. It's very clear you can see the shape of the basis in the functions actually. And then with different values, so this W1 here is now 0.5. So we see a slight scaled down version of this first basis function in the function. Um, W2 is very small, minus 0.04, so we don't see anything in the middle and W3 is 0.26 so we see a scaled down version of that basis function so this is just a random sample but you're right what we're going to need to do is given a data set estimate W so, so W is a function? W is not a function it's a vector but in this case I'm sampling it from a probability distribution because what I'm trying to understand is if you didn't have the W's if all the W's were 1 you would have a composite function of some sort if all the W's were 1, we'd just see a function that goes whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah? So in fact, um, we, can, uh, we can look at that briefly. So it might help, although I haven't prepared for this, so it might not help, uh, because I might do it all wrong, for me to just do a quick example. So bear in mind that I don't have this on screen, so I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. But let's try. Uh, let's try x equals lin space uh, minus 2 to 100. OK? OK, so we've now got an x which is ranging across that um, uh, input. Uh, let's get rid of that. Let's say, so phi 1, so this is the first basis function. We're just going to compute it on the basis of x. And the way I defined it in the slides is equal to mp dot x. In fact, I have to probably... Let me just run it all so that... Um, uh, where's all? Okay, that makes sure that... NumPy's loaded, Exp exponent of minus 2 times x plus 1. Oh, now in Python, is it star star for squared? Is that? That's right, isn't it? Yeah? Um, so that's giving me my first basis. So that's the basis that we had on the slides um, here. Oh, they were there. Here, minus 2 x plus 1 all squared. Yeah, so you can actually factorize that in a certain way. Um, that's okay. So that's the first basis, and then I can say phi 2 is equal to uh, if I can get up my slides on this screen. Uh, Uh, so we call it e to the minus 2x squared mp dot x minus 2 times x dot r2 yeah and phi 3 is equal to mp dot x minus 2x minus 1 so that's the basis that's the third basis function which is actually centered on 1 okay now this is where I find out I've got an error because I press shift enter oh, there we go after two in the brackets. Uh, which one, sorry? After two in the brackets. Exponential. Exponential. 
The third one. Oh, I can't see. Ah, there's a times, yes. Gee, isn't it amazing you just can't see? Everyone else can see in the room. This is, this is what lecturing's like. Uh, there we go, good. Um, so that's given me the basis there. Now, so if I want to plot uh, this basis, um, we, you said, what if all the Ws are 1? Yeah. So what we can do is we can go pb.plot, and then on the x-axis we'll have x, and then what we'll say is 1 times phi 1 plus 1 times phi 2 plus 1 times phi 3. Yeah? There it is. Yeah, that's the function we get. So it wasn't quite like I described because I said it'd probably go down, but actually the, the cumulative value means that they go up. Now what I've been showing you is I've been effectively doing this. So I've been saying um, W is equal to NP dot random dot is it normal? Yeah. Uh, now what's the, is it 3 comma 1 or 1 comma 3? Uh, I think it's 3 in this case. What is it? 3, yeah. So 3. In fact, if I do rand n, that gives me just the... Is that right? Let's see if, that's, if it likes that. Yep, it likes that. And then what I'll put here is uh, W... Well, we'll put... Um, I print W in, so we see what the values we've sampled. So we're sampling from a Gaussian, this line here samples from a, a standard normal, a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one, yeah, the so-called standard normal. And then I'll just put in here W zero times phi one, W one times phi two, and W two times phi three, okay? And then let's see if that works. Okay, so now it said it happens to sample the first element is 1.34. So that first basis function is having a big effect here. He goes up to 1.34. No surprise there. The next one's 0.33. So there's very little effects in the middle. There's sort of zero effect here. And the next one's minus 0.13. So it's dropping back down again. So we're getting a function like that. So that makes sense what I've been doing with the samples there and how you can create a basis in uh, Python, yeah? Okay? Yeah. Good. I think that's important that that's clear because the basis will be the basis of all we do now. Sorry, that just came to me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so in that sense, back to that awkward, I mean the basis, it's the foundation of what you're building your function on. That's, as I'd rather, yeah, that's my answer. So I'm going to edit the video going back here. So it's a basis in that it's a foundation for what you're building your entire function on. Um, yeah, okay. Oh. Now that's not good that when I viewed it full screen, it appeared on the other screen. Let's see if I can. Uh, So I think what we need to do now though is, as you sort of pointed out, well, we've got to, how, where do we get these W's from? Okay, so just some reading, so, there's a, so this is material that I thought I'd include in the slides for future reference. Uh, two books that I'd recommend um, that actually I've been using uh, for teaching this material are the book by Simon Rogers and Mark Girolami. Um, which is something called an introduction to machine learning and they take very much the same perspective I'm taking on probabilistic regression um, they use slightly different notation and then the other book is uh, the Chris Bishop book which is like the textbook in machine learning it has this material spread sort of throughout it in various parts and so I've tried to give reference to where that is so if you have access to those books that's just a, a couple of little references there so the problem is now that we need to find these W's. So what we're going to have to do is a linear regression. Well, it's a non-linear regression. It can be a linear or non-linear regression, but the basic situation is we now have a multivariate input. So I've rewritten as X here, 
but it could be phi. And we often use phi and x interchangeably when we're writing down these sort of regressions. So I think in the lab we're using phi, and in the notes I'm using x. So the idea is that um, you've got to find this. What we had before was this was phi directly, but it could also be a multi-dimensional input on x. So we talked about regression examples where the input could be multi-dimensional. I can't remember what they were. They were things like... Um, if you've got backgammon and you're predicting the quality of the move, you might have three or four examples of, um, input location, uh, of input features that you're using to predict the quality of the move. Um, the sort of things that um, uh, have been really interested in working on with, uh, with John um, and that Ricardo and Martin are looking at, you've got, so if we're trying to predict um, malaria incidents across Uganda, um, our inputs could be spatial location, uh, north and south. They could be um, time. Um, we could also try and use other information. We could say, well, we know that rainfall has an influence, so we could have the cumulative recent rainfall as an additional regression input. We could have the altitude of uh, that part as an additional input. Um, we could have, what else? So Martin's been looking at vegetation indices. So um, from satellite information, you can compute what the veg, anything that we think might affect the malaria instance in that region, we can put on a regression. Um, so our X is no longer just time. Our X is now time, but it's also which department we're in, uh, could be in terms of spatial location, it's vegetation, it's rainfall, potentially temperature, all these things can go in and might be helpful in, predicting, in making the prediction. So let's assume that we're just making a linear prediction, so we're just saying, well, now actually we believe malaria instance is a weighted sum of all those things. Yeah, so the number of malaria cases in a particular reason is given by a weighted sum of all those things. Um, now, those things, so those things can be thought of as features, but our basis functions as well can be thought of as features that we're creating. So they're special features, they're ones that locally respond. So maybe, why do you need these type of basis functions? Maybe you only get an increase in malaria if the rainfall is over a certain value and below a certain other value. That a basis function will help because what will happen then is you'll get this basis function will turn out to be important. The rainfall is the input. And then when the rain falls in this region, you get a response, which affects the malaria incidence. Um, but these things aren't being used. So you only get a response when the rain falls within certain bounds. That's the sort of effect that, that's a non-linear effect, right? So it's not just increasing constantly with uh, increasing rainfall. Um, the non-linear effect means that you can detect that type of response and that's what you can use basis functions for and that becomes like a, a new set of features um, so this, this feature here ends up being used and these two features aren't used there's no weight on them so rainfall in these regions is not used it doesn't affect anything so you end up learning a weight of zero on these two things so we can think of these things as features um, and we can interchangeably use x, which could be a direct feature, or phi, which could be a basis function computation on the feature. Does that make sense? So we can write this in vector notation, and I think vector notation is so useful. Linear algebra is really where it's at for these type of models, because um, it's a very compact form way of writing this. So. Of course, this is just a, an inner product, so all this means is the same as this. But what we're going to be able to use are the rules of differentiation for matrices in order to do the optimization we need to discover W. And that's why we, we need linear algebra, because doing the differentiation directly on the scalars is a lot more involved. You either end up with what we had last time, this iterative solution for let's optimize M and let's optimize C, if you just optimize each one individually, or you try and take account of them both, you have to use clever substitutions in order to get the solution. Now using matrix algebra, it's just trivial. There's just some rules. It's just an extended form of algebra, and that's why we'll go to this type of representation. But as I sort of talked about before, we don't even need this plus C. So in this representation, it's like a multivariate input. Our MX is now W transpose X. But the plus C can just be integrated 
in here by adding an extra basis which is constant. So we'll just write that our function is just a linear mapping from these inputs to some new function. Okay. So maximum likelihood is exactly what we do as before. So the likelihood of a single data point as before we had f of x in here, but it was minus mx minus c because our f of x was mx plus c. Now, in this case, it's this w transpose x. So it just disappears as the mean of that Gaussian density again. So what we're saying is that we believe our data y, our observation y, um, will be given by w transpose x, these features, plus some Gaussian noise. That's exactly what we said before for the one-dimensional linear regression. And that's for one data point if we use independence assumptions about that noise. So we make an independence assumption that the noise is independently added to each data point. Then the, date, the likelihood of the entire data set, the log likelihood, as we wrote down before, has this form. So we had exactly this form yesterday. I think I wrote those two the other way around. Um, and in here we had minus mxi plus minus c. Yeah. So it's exactly what we looked like yesterday, and then we get a corresponding error function where this is the part of this likelihood, and it's the negative part of this likelihood that's dependent on our parameters, which are now sigma squared, the variance, and w. And the error function has this form. So this is what we want to optimize, and this is a multivariate least squares problem. Um, so now we have w appearing inside here. Now how do we do this optimization? Well, the first thing to do is uh, to expand out uh, these brackets. So what I've done on this first line is take this quadratic. So these are scalars, right? So I can multiply out this bracket. So I get a y times a y, and I get... Um, uh, minus W transpose X times a minus W transpose X and I get a YI times W transpose X term, yeah? So they're all scalars but the nice thing that happens and this is a really important thing because this is what shows you all the correlations and stuff is if you write it in this term so there's my Y terms Y term and I've, I've just pulled the sum in here's my Y times W transpose X and it's multiplied by 2 so we, we lose the half Everything's divided by sigma squared. Now, this is important. This is the W transpose X times W transpose X, but I've written it in a particular way. Instead of writing W transpose X squared like this, I've written it twice. W transpose XI, XI transpose W. And the reason I've written like, like that is I can now pull the sum inside this W transpose and I can identify this as a matrix. Why is that a matrix? I don't know how, how many people are using linear algebra much. There's only one rule of linear algebra we need here. Um, so I'll just write down what that rule is. That, and this is vital. Whenever you're doing, this is, the, you can spot so many errors in your own maths if you just know this little rule of linear algebra, which is about what you're allowed to multiply by what. So matrices are these objects, so these are vectors, but this vector has become a matrix. It's the first, it just naturally emerges in the ma maximum likelihood solution. So a vector, um, W, if it's got K entries, it's just, now vectors are always column vectors. As far as I'm concerned, a row vector does never exist because it's confusing if you believe that row vectors can exist as well. So once something's in vector form, I always see it as a column. Um, and what we've got here is the W, uh, well, in, in Python, it's W0, W1, W2. And, and this is what we've been creating in Python, yeah? So this is, and I say, okay, in Python, row vectors do exist. But mathematically, when we write these things down, I, I always think of columns, right? So this is basically um, a matrix which we can say uh, is in the real numbers and then we say the number of rows which is k if k are the number of uh, basis functions and the number of columns which is simply one now if we multiply to a matrix by a vector we're allowed to do that so if I define a matrix which is of course just the generalization of the vector um, where you have sort of 
uh, m rows and n columns. If I want to my, multiply a matrix A by this vector W, A times W, I'm only allowed to do it if the number of columns in this matrix matches the number of rows in that matrix. So the easy thing to do to write down what you're going to get is if you say A is well, we have to say A is therefore M by K. So you write down M, which is number of rows, times K, number of columns, and then you write down the, you're multiplying that by K rows times one column. And this will work if these two inner dimensions match, and the result will be an M by one, right? Now what we're doing here, because of the way I've written it, these are scalars. So this, this matrix, it's not a matrix because it's two vectors multiplying by each other, it's a, it's a K, it's a 1 by K times a K by 1, so it leads to a 1 by 1. I can transpose it because a transpose of a scalar is just a scalar. So I'm transposing it here, and I'm getting uh, a 1 by K, sorry, uh, yeah, 1 by K, because this is transpose, times a K by 1, times a 1 by K, times a K by 1. So this thing in the middle is a k by 1 times a 1 by k. So what size is it? K by k, k, by k precisely. And then this thing here, when I bring it in, is just a sum over k by k matrices. Yeah? So this thing is a k by k matrix. And while that's a, one, a rank 1 k by k matrix, this one is rank n. So it's a full matrix. And it turns out to be a, a vital component of the modeling. And, the linear algebra is emerging naturally from having written it in this terms. So what I can do now, once I've got it in this form, is this is a quadratic form. It is very easy to differentiate and optimize. And that's why we go for this type of representation. So the rules of differentiation for matrices, if you're differentiating with respect to, right, this really confusing stuff online. I would recommend the Matrix Reference Manual by Mike Brooks. It's completely consistent and it's always, you can use all the rules together. It's a fantastic reference, it's a fantastic piece of work and it's available freely. It's brilliant for understanding all aspects of linear algebra and it's totally consistent. And one of the things he really um, does nicely is he has a, a rule that says you can never you can only ever differentiate a maximum a vector by a vector. You can't differentiate a matrix by a vector because that's a hard thing to write down. Um, you can't even, it's best even if you don't think of differentiating matrices by scalar. But one thing you're allowed to do is differentiate a scalar by a vector. Um, and the result is a scalar. It's all the partial derivatives of this function with respect to each element of this. So this represents here the partial derivatives of each element A, A1, A is the partial derivative of A transpose W with respect to W1. And A2, well the, the second element here is the partial derivative of A transpose W with respect to W2. And if you think about all those, in this case, because this is just multiplication and adding, you just get the vector A out. So this is the first rule that we need of multivariate calculus. They're nice simple rules. Um, and this is effectively the equivalent of just differentiation of, you know, so if I, if I made A scalar, if I said dA times W by dW and A was scalar, the answer would be A. And it works out the same in the multivariate case. In the quadratic, this is a quadratic form. So we've got a similar situation and it also works out rather nicely the same. There are, if A is symmetric, so you get this result, but A is symmetric in our case, so we end up with this 2A times W. So you can differentiate this quadratic form by W, and you can differentiate this linear form by W. Um, so that, if you look at what we've got here, and look what's a function of W, we have a linear form here, W transpose A, and we have a quadratic form, W transpose A, capital A, W. Yeah? So it's easy to differentiate this once you've got it in the correct linear algebra form. The only trick you need is to remember to write that in that form. Otherwise you get confused about what to do. So you just have to remember to write this thing in that form and then pull the sum in and then you get this matrix. So this is the... Ah, bother. So I've now defined 
we didn't notice this. I've defined beta as 1 over sigma squared. Um, so this should be 1 over sigma squared. Apologies for that. Um, so what we have here is the gradient of the linear term, which is just a. This is our a from the previous slide. And the gradient of our quadratic term, which is... Uh, two times a. Now there was a factor of half in front of the quadratic term, so that's disappeared. There was no factor of half in front of the linear term. Yeah? So this is what I'm defining beta to be, is 1 over sigma squared. Um, now you get a factor of half here which disappears in the quadratic term, so you basically just get beta appearing again. It's always there, 1 over sigma squared, and the factor of half cancels, and then you have this capital matrix A times W. Now that is then easy to solve as this result. So if you want to set this to zero, you want to find when the gradient of W is zero, you put zero on this side and solve for W. And doing that leads us to this solution, this one-step solution for the multivariate uh, linear regression, which has this form. The maximum likelihood solution for W is given by the matrix inverse of this matrix composed of all your data times this other matrix composed of your targets and your data. And that's the solution for linear regression. Now, I like to write this in a matrix form. Turns out that if you define... So, what we're introducing here is something called a design matrix. And that's a concept from statistics. So, I believe you should always use design matrices. Unfortunately, the Gaussian process book, uh, which is the best reference on this, redefines everything at the beginning, which is a great shame. But in statistics, a design matrix is a matrix of... Oh, this pen seems... I thought this pen didn't work either. Damn. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just occupy myself filling in the brackets while we search for the other pen. The problem is there's this odd effect that when you write over the line previously, the old line disappears. Here we go. Okay. Okay, the, so, um, okay, that one's actually exactly the same. <laughs> and the pen's on strike today. <laughs> okay. But, so that, that's the main shape of it. So, this design, actually, that's coming out better now. It's warmed up. Um, it has N rows, where N is the number of data points, and K columns where k is the number of features. So it's where we take our input data, we always put each set of features. So for the malaria example, this row represents one measurement, it represents the location of the measurement, the time of the measurement, the rainfall that we'd had in that measurement, uh, what else do we say, the vegetation index in that location, all that information in a vector here going along in the row. Yeah, And so each row is an observation that we've been provided with by the Ministry of Health or whatever. Now, you could write that the other way around. You could decide, I want my observations in the columns. And there's no reason you should do one or the other. It's just convention. Just like which side of the road you decide to drive on. Everyone knows it's correct to drive on the left, but some people in the world decide to drive on the right for some unknown reason. It doesn't matter, really, whether you drive on the left or the right, as long as everyone who's living in the same place chooses to drive on the left or the right. Uh, just in the design matrices, it doesn't really matter which way around it is, as long as everyone chooses the same way around. Now, statisticians defined it like this a long time ago, so I believe we should use it like that, or else it confuses the statisticians. A lot of people in computer science kind of like to see the data like that. I think it's because it feels like the data's coming in, or I don't know why they... Anyway but please try and resist that temptation and if you do define your data matrix to be like that then we call it X this is the design matrix then this relationship moves to this relationship maybe that's why people like it the other way around because the T now appears in the middle here just because of a matter of definition if you think about the matrix multiplication going on to get this you need to have it that way around yeah and then it's just written in matrix form you can drop these silly sum signs yeah a um, little bit less Greek in your uh, equations. So that's how I like to write it. And this one has this form. This is like the weighted sum. This is, in matrix form, the weighted sum of each of those rows being added together. Yeah. So if we define the design matrix like that, this is what we get. And that means it's a sort of a two-liner. 
in MATLAB or Python or R or whatever to do this linear regression. You just have to get your data in the right form and then you just have to solve this system of equations um, for W. Uh, you just, these two matrices, well this matrix and this vector, this turns out to be a vector, are the, the only important components. And I think that's uh, what we're going to do now. Okay, so that's the update for W star and we're going to what we're going to do is uh, do the lab, but we're going to make our design matrix out of a basis set, yeah? So in the lab class, you'll see what we're going to do is just go through creating a new basis for the um, marathon data, and uh, we're going to create that basis, and then we're going to solve for the coefficients we need, the W, that was the question from before, how do we get W? Here's your answer. So. In the lab class, instead of phi being, instead of uh, x being direct features, you're going to be using phi. I like to write that capital phi, which is at each row, it's the computation. So for the polynomial case, it's a 1, an x, and an x squared is each row, uh, each column, sorry. So that first column is just all 1s. The second column is all x's, and the third column is all x squared. And that gives us a matrix phi, and then the solution we'll see in the lab class is asking for is saying compute phi transpose matrix multiply. Now be careful, because in Python it can be very confusing uh, what matrix multiply is. It's actually a command for some bizarre reason called dot, np dot dot. My postdoc James explained why it might be called dot, but the explanation was so convolved that I just don't think it's worth giving, but it's just called dot, np dot dot. Well, you can, I think you, there's other ways of doing it, but that's the shortest one. So you're going to do a matrix multiply of the basis matrix you comp uh, compute, and then you'll, do, uh, you'll get the vector there. And actually, you won't do it in this way. Because in pra and it's nice in some sense that the way you'll, do, you'll use um, uh, a linear algebra, the commands written in the notes, uh, a solution uh, which is solve a system of equations. The reason for that is that you shouldn't really, I mean we do sometimes, occasionally there are occasions where I will invert directly a matrix. But in general, you shouldn't really do that. So your temptation might be to compute phi transpose phi, invert it, and then multiply it by x transpose y. Yeah, And that's okay. It's going to work okay. It's going to be okay. But numerically, it's often not a good thing to do. So a better thing to do is to remember that this is really phi transpose phi times w equals phi transpose y. And that's like a form of a times x equals b. And that's a well-known thing that you can solve for in linear algebra. There are methods for solving for that directly. So if you have an equation ax equals b, solve for x, then that's something that people do. They've written direct algorithms for dealing with that. And those direct algorithms take into account relationships between a and b. I mean, it's just a sort of um, simultaneous system of equations when you think about it, like we saw on the first day. This is a simultaneous system of equations where you have um, A as the uh, knowns, X as the unknowns, and B as the knowns. And that's what they call it in numerical analysis. In our case, of course, it's A, W equals B, but in numerical analysis, X are always the um, unknowns, whereas for us they're the data, so x is really appearing in a and b here. So you can solve these systems directly and there's a command for doing that and that's what you'll do in Python, that's the numerically stable way of doing it. In fact, as you go up, as you expand the number, the examples I'll show you later of the fits you're gonna, you can get as you increase the order of the polynomial, don't work unless you do it correctly in this solve way. If you try and invert the matrix directly, you get numerical problems and the solution doesn't come out well. Um, so you do need to do it like that. So, um, so are you saying that uh, phi is going to be x transpose x? No, it's phi transpose phi. So everywhere you see x, you have to think phi. In this here, in the lab sheet it's written correctly. So where you see, so you're going to compute so this is why we can sometimes think of doing a linear problem in the feature space, right? So there's two ways of seeing what our inputs are. Either, like in the malaria, or two ways of seeing why you need a multi, 
variant linear regression. In the malaria example, we needed it because they've given us all this data. So we have to, we've got a matrix X of data instead of a vector X of data, which we had for the marathon running example. But in the marathon running example, we're creating a matrix of data by taking the one dimensional input and mapping it into all these different phi's. So it's like we're mapping it to a new X and the new X has phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 as its features. So this is the weird thing that we end up interchangeably using X and phi and I apologize, I should probably have just chosen one or the other. Um, so you can think of, if you're using X, you're basically doing a linear regression in the original space, yeah? But if you're using phi, it implies that you've made a non-linear mapping to this new basis and you're doing a linear regression in the non-linear space. So it ends up as like a non-linear regression in terms of that you get non-linear functions out. But very oddly in mathematics, everyone talks about that as a linear system because it's still linear. <laughs> it's, there's no non-linearities in the parameters we're interested in fitting. They appear linearly in all the equations. We're doing a non-linear regression, but the parameters appear linearly in all the equations. So the non-linearity comes through substituting x for phi. Yeah? Um, and you should be able to work out because of the design matrix set up if you've got k features or k basis functions this matrix is x transpose so it's a k by n this matrix here is an n by k so this matrix in total will be a k by k this one is k by n this is n by 1 so this matrix will be a k by 1 k by k times a k by 1, so this is k by k inverse is k by k, times a k by 1 will give me a k by 1, so w will correctly be a k by 1. Sanity check, yeah? Really useful when you're actually writing down the math. Python does some really nasty things that MATLAB doesn't do. Python, when you mismatch some of these dimensions, will go, oh, obviously he didn't mean me to do what he's told me to do. I'm going to do something called a broadcast and expand things out. It's a nightmare. MATLAB doesn't do that. Um, it's a nightmare for teaching and for debugging. So you have to be aware of that. MATLAB would just throw an error if you mismatch the dimensions. Python tries to be clever, um, which I think is unhelpful. It's called broadcasting. Uh, but yeah, you should always sanity check your maths and everything to make sure you've got the dimensions coming out in the correct way. So x is phi for your lab class. You're going to create a new design matrix where the features now are not the direct inputs, they're the nonlinear transformations of the inputs. So the inputs are, the features are, first one's constant, second one's the actual year of the marathon race, and the third feature is the squared year of the marathon race. <laughs> the reason why you get numerical problems in this setup is because as you start to square numbers like 1980, they get rather big. And uh, that's why <laughs> You need to be careful about how, um, how, you, how you do your numerics. Uh, I mean, one shouldn't do it that way, but uh, we'll avoid that for the moment. So let's uh, switch over to the lab uh, class now, which is the same lab sheet as the other. Well, let's have tea and those wonderful sweet bananas. Um, oh, questions, yeah, good, good point. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do, do define phi? How do you get it? You just compute it. So okay, let me. Let, that's worth me doing. Okay, so let's um. So let's have a little run through here. So so at this point we're we're at x. So we're gonna. What should we do? I've redefined x here. So let's get rid of uh, that. That. And that. And so we've got our x. If, we now, if I now run all, I hope, yeah, I have now x and y are the years. And we're doing the full linear regression there. So um, how am I going to create phi? Now, I can't remember the concatenation command, but I end up... You mean how, how do you choose? How do you choose it? Yeah. Ah. You said you had to run your basis. How do you choose it for you? Right. Good question. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. So, you, you were asking the philosophical question rather than the practical question <laughs> of how do I create phi. Um, yes, 
that basis choice is what it's all going to come down to in the end. So there are problems. How many basis functions do we select? Where do we put them? You know, there are parameters in these basis functions, right? Um, and we can solve some of those problems. And as we solve some of those problems, I mean, and we'll also get other things like overfitting as we increase the complexity of our basis. We're going to see that. Um, as we solve those problems, we're going to come down to one final problem, which is what do you want to say about your data? Yeah? So remember, I said machine learning is model plus data. Someone's given us the data, so all the thinking comes in the model. So it's going to come down to that. At the end of the day, we're always going to be stuck with that problem. How do we choose our model? What is the right model to choose? The goal of machine learning is in some ways to replicate the human ability to intuitively extract a sensible model and perform intelligently. The place we're stuck at at the moment is you need to have a bit of domain knowledge, a bit of expertise, some sensible understanding of the data. So in the marathon example, domain knowledge would be like, I don't believe humans are going to keep running faster and faster forever. We're converging towards some maximum speed. Um, and each year we'll get closer and closer, but we'll improve less and less. That's the type of domain knowledge one should be including in that example, and that we're not including because we're trying to explore beyond that example. Um, and that's the sort of thing you'll need to put in your basis. Yeah? So in, uh, when Gauss did this for predicting the orbits of the planets, the domain knowledge he used was Newton. He used Newton's laws to define his basis. So he understood how the planets should move and his basis became how the planets should be moving. So that, those are two domain specific uh, basis choices. But I think that's where all the interest is. At the end of, you know, at the end of hopefully uh, tomorrow's lecture, then you'll have the tools to know what things to do. You perhaps won't have the full experience to know which basis to choose. One thing I can assure you is a polynomial basis will very rarely be the correct basis. Uh, if, if not never. It's a terrible basis for reasons we'll see in the lab class. So probably the answer is not polynomial. <laughs> um, uh, although it's often used for practical reasons because it's got some nice analytic properties. It's used, for example, for solving differential equations. People assume polynomial fits because differentiation of polynomials leads to other polynomials. It keeps everything within the same class. But um, yeah, okay. So I won't show you that, so we'll go back to the lab class now. So picking up where you left off here, and the first thing you're going to be trying to do, I believe, is defining phi. So phi equals question mark. But before we do that, let's have tea and sweet bananas. Okay? So any other questions? Yeah, Good. Um, see, something confusing me. You see, from the way you define um, W, when we start computing W from the function that we have, because W seems to be a function that is outside there. Well, W is a vector, yeah. not a function. It's a vector, but it's not something that we can um, compute within the parameters that we have, especially if you take a real scenario. So we can only estimate W. Even if we had the right model, we wouldn't know what W is, but maximum likelihood is about being able to estimate. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but this equation, oh brother. This equation here, ah, it's come on this screen, bother. Um, that equation here is an our estimate for W. W is an unknown, unknown parameters. We don't know the real values for W, but we can estimate them through maximum likelihood. And that's what we're going to use for our predictions. So we estimate them based on the data. But, but for practical purposes, that estimate is not close to the actual value. Uh, no, we can show. Uh, so what consistency of maximum likelihood does is it tells us that if we have the correct model, which is a big if, and I think we never have the correct model, um, and as data goes to infinity, then our estimate for W will get closer and closer to the truth. But what we're going to do after the lab, potentially I hope, is do the Bayesian 
interpretation for W where we treat W probabilistically and then that gives us an estimate of W that is a probability distribution and it shows us potentially how far away we are from the truth. Okay? Right, so let's have some tea. Yeah?